Welcome to Thrive. We are so glad to have you here with us today. For those of you that may not know me, my name is Judah Thomas. I'm the lead pastor here at Thrive. And we want to welcome you here this morning, or if you're watching online, we want to welcome you as well. And we thank you for joining us as we start this new series called Brave. Now, I don't know uh, if, if you in your life, if you consider yourself courageous or not. Some of you maybe think that you're courageous. Uh, some of you might think that, uh, well, the courage gene just didn't hit you for some reason. And, uh, and, and, and you know, courage is something that we, we think about. We think about people that maybe do extreme sports or that, that serve our country or different things. But some of us, instead of, instead of living in courage, we have this spirit of fear. And, and in God's word, we see that it says that God hasn't given us a spirit of fear, but of power and love and a sound mind. But we hear so many things in our world and we get, we get intimidated by all the bad news. Has anybody heard any bad news this week? Some of, you, some of you have heard bad news. The rest of you just maybe haven't listened to the news or you haven't been on Facebook. But there's bad news everywhere, it seems like. And, uh, and we're going to start out by reading in Philippians. And Paul wrote this. And, and it says in Philippians chapter 4, verse 6, we're going to read it in the New King James Version. You can follow along on the Version app if you'd like to. Anxious this for nothing. How you doing with that? Let's get real for a minute. How you doing with that? I, I mean, let, let's pull off the mask, you know, the, the, hey, good morning, brother. How you doing? Great. How are you doing? No, no, no. How are we really doing with that? Be anxious for nothing. Man, there's so many things that cause anxiety. Man, in this day and age that we have, if, if you're prone to anxiety, there's enough to feed it, isn't there? And if you're not prone to anxiety, there's still enough to maybe convince you to try out being anxious for a while. Just be anxious for nothing. But in what? In everything. Not just some things, in everything by prayer and supplication. It says, it says be anxious for nothing, but in everything that you face, pray about it. Goes on to say, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with what? With thanksgiving. Sometimes I wonder if we're just not very thankful people. I wonder if our level of thankfulness correlates to our level of anxiety. Maybe the more thankful we are, the less anxious we are. And the, and the less thankful we are, the more anxious we are. Because it says, be anxious for nothing, but instead, with thanksgiving. What's thanksgiving? It's praise. It's praising God. It's putting God first. It says, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. It's saying, don't be anxious about it. If you feel anxiety, let those requests be made known to God. Verse 7, and the peace of God. Does anybody want any peace? Anyone? A couple of you want it. The rest of you, I don't know. Maybe you're sleeping and you're getting all the peace you need right now. It says, and the peace of God. 
Man, we want this peace of God, don't we? Which surpasses all understanding. Maybe you've been in a situation like that before when, when, when you're, you're experiencing storms and waves in your life and you don't know how you could get through it. But somehow you have this peace which it says surpasses all understanding. It doesn't make sense that you're being calm right now. It doesn't make sense that everything's not falling apart. But even though everything's coming at you, you have this peace that surpasses all understanding. And he says it'll guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Now think about Paul when he wrote this. Do you know where Paul was when he wrote this? He was in jail. And he must be right in this. Be anxious for nothing. Man, he had a lot to be anxious for, didn't he? Man, he had a lot. I mean, he's in prison for crying out loud. He's probably going to get killed. He's in prison. He's saying, be anxious for nothing. Pray about everything. With thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will... Hey, there's a guard there. There's another one over there. And what do those guards do? They prevent me from getting out, but they also prevent other things from getting in as well. So let it guard your heart like these guards are guarding me. Let this peace guard your heart and minds through Christ Jesus. Does anybody want verse 7 where it says the peace which passes all understanding? We want verse 7, but guess what? We're not going to get it until we go through verse 6. Be anxious for nothing. I've noticed that kids tend to have irrational fears. I don't know if you've seen this before. If you have children, maybe you know. I have three kids, and, and, and they have these irrational fears. And, um, and I don't always understand it. Like, like, my oldest daughter, she loves being on the stage. Belle loves, absolutely loves it. If she's in front of people, she's happy and thrilled. The next daughter, Macy, not so much. Like, I mean, we, like we, we force her sometimes. We're like, you're going to go up there because we want to break her of that. But she's just like, she just has this fear of being up there. My son has probably the most irrational fear I've ever heard about. This has happened numerous times where he wakes up in the middle of the night and he's crying and we go in there and we're like, what's the matter, buddy? He's like, a hippo bit my belly. <laughs> I'm like, really? He, he's like afraid that a hippo is going to break in the house and bite his belly. Am, am I telling the truth? Okay, just want to make sure. I'm not lying. I'm making it up here. Now, it would make sense if he lived in a place that had hippos that occasionally broke in and bit people's bellies, but he's never even seen a hippo that I'm aware of in his life, but yet he's afraid that one's going to break in and bite his belly. He's not afraid of other things, though. He's jump off stuff, whatever, but man, these hippos. My, uh, I, my, my oldest daughter, as of recently, is, has been very afraid of ISIS. A lot of us are afraid of ISIS. The problem is that she has no clue what ISIS even is. It's just, it's just letters, and she hears us saying stuff about ISIS, and, and so she's afraid of it. And the other day, she's like, by the way, what is ISIS? And I'm like, well... Some bad people trying to take over parts of the world. That's all you need to know right now. I mean, I'm not like letting her watch the news, but she has this irrational fear. All, all of my kids at some point have had an irrational fear of dogs. I don't understand why. I mean, we, we, you know, we let them be around dogs. And Macy, she's, she's the funniest one because even though she's afraid of dogs, she absolutely loves them. I mean, she loves them, but she just, you know, she loves them like over there, you know. But sometimes don't we have irrational fears as well? When we look at the stock market and the Dow Jones and, and all this, the, the investments that we have, and we get these irrational fears. You start watching CNN, MSNBC, we watch all these things, and we get these irrational fears that, that are shoved at us. We, we, we hear about, you know, these crazy things and these chemicals and Legos. Oh, if the kids chew on Legos, they're going to get hairy backs. And, you know, it's like we get these irrational fears. But Paul wrote this letter from, from prison. Man, he had stuff to be afraid of, but he's saying, don't be anxious for anything. That word anxious um, in the Greek, I'm sure you're all really wondering what the Greek word is for that, but I'm going to tell you anyhow. <laughs> it's uh, merimnao, 
Miramnao. Now, now this word is interesting because it's, it's what we talk about, about anxiety or care. But you know what it really means? One of the, the actual definitions of Miramnao is, is divided, torn apart, to tear or to cut into pieces. And sometimes this is what the peace looks like in our life. We, we want to have peace, but it's just all torn up into little bitty pieces. We watch the news, we get afraid, we get anxious, and our lives become just all this torn up bits. Just be anxious for nothing. Now there's a difference between being worried and being concerned, right? There's some things that we need to be concerned about. If they say, like this past week, they say, oh, there may be a tornado coming through your area. Well, rightfully so, we may be a little bit concerned. We might bring our stuff inside. We might secure our homes and our things out in our yard. But there's a difference between worry and concern. And it's interesting because in the Greek, it both is the same word, merimnao, which means worry, and it means care or concern. See, what it is, is it's the same outward circumstance, but how we approach it is different. One person can approach something with care and concern, and another person approaches that very same thing with anxiety. Be anxious for nothing. Be anxious for no thing. You ever hear that phrase, it ain't nothing but a thing? Anybody heard it? It ain't nothing but a thing. Some of you guys have heard it before. It ain't nothing but a thing. And what's that mean? It's just, it's just a thing. You know, there was a, uh, a guy um, I knew of when I was uh, traveling with a band for a while. And, and he was a big time Eric Clapton fan. Now, Eric Clapton, during that time period, had just released his signature... Fender Stratocaster Eric Clapton model. So this guy being an Eric Clapton fan went out and he bought this guitar and he, he you know, thought it was a great guitar. Anyhow, he was playing with some friends and the other guy had a guitar and the music stand fell and it gouged this other guy's guitar. So this guy with a brand new guitar took his, because the guy got all upset, he's all bit out of shape, took his guitar, dropped it on the floor, says, it ain't nothing but a thing. It ain't nothing but a tool. Come on, man. Pick up your guitar and let's play. And sometimes we get so worried about the things in our life. We, we get anxious about the things in our life. Now, we sh there are things that we should be concerned about. Concerned about the state of our soul. Concerned about our children. Are they growing in the way they should grow? Are they growing to love God and follow Him? We should be concerned about God's work here in America and in our communities but not concerned about things. You know, there's a lot of things that are going on in our world. You know, and, and Supreme Court has made certain decisions, but you know something? Supreme Court can't dethrone God. Did you know that? Come on, I mean, I mean, here's the thing. Everybody's all like, oh, this and all that. And all that. Whatever. Whatever. People are going to do what people are going to do. See, the, the law isn't what's going to change the heart of America. It's the people that are going to change the laws that change the heart of America. See, it, it's got to start inside of us. We shouldn't be worried about these things. God is still on the throne. Man, a lot of worse things have happened in civilizations, and God has still reigned supreme over all of them. Right. Romans 8. Romans 8 verse 31 says this. He says, what then shall we say in response to these things? There ain't nothing but a thing. What should we say in response to these things? If God is for us, what? Let's say that together. Who can be against us? Now this gives me courage. If God is for me, ain't no Supreme Court can be against me. If God is for me, it doesn't matter what you say about me. If God is for me, it doesn't matter if you don't like me. If God is on my side, then I'm good. And if God's not on my side, then I'm in trouble anyway. Man, who can be against us? We can still stand strong in the face of opposition. I'm not talking about being cocky here. This is confidence in knowing that God says, if I'm for you, ain't nobody going to be against you. Verse 32, he says, He who did not spare his own son, 
but gave him up for us all. How will then he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? Here we are worried about things, and, and he's saying, don't worry about those things. They ain't nothing but a thing. But you put your trust and your faith in God, and he'll graciously give you all things. Let's skip down to verse 37, still in Romans 8. It says, no, in all these, what? Things. We are more than conquerors through him who loved us. We are more than conquerors. Now, now, what do you think of as a conqueror? You think of a conqueror as someone who is valiant, who, who defeated. This is, you're more than a conqueror. This was like not even a match. This was like, you know, we went in there and we destroyed the place. He says, you are more than a conqueror, not just on your own though, through him who loved us. This gives us courage because in all these things that you face, whatever you're facing in your life right now, I don't know what it is, but you're probably facing something. And some of these things look like they're going to overtake you and they're going to drag you down. It says, no, you are more than a conqueror through him that loves you. Verse 38 says, For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels or demons, nor the present or the future, nor any powers, nor height, nor depth, or anything, to fill in the blank here, in case I missed what's bothering you, in case I missed the thing that's holding you back, in case I missed the thing that's causing you anxiety. Or anything. Paul went through all this stuff. This is some heavy stuff he's talking about here. Neither height nor death nor anything else in creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. It doesn't matter. You may be facing bankruptcy. You might be jobless or homeless. Maybe your life is controlled by an addiction. It ain't nothing but a thing. Because God says that he will make you more than conquerors through Jesus Christ. He says that, that all these things, man, God is over them and it cannot separate you. It ain't nothing but a thing. You say, well, but sometimes I just feel anxious for nothing. I just, feel, I just feel anxious for these things. How many times, though, you say... Don't be, anx uh, be anxious for nothing. But how many times are we anxious for nothing? For nothing. You know, this past April was tax season. And um, I got a phone call. And, and I'm, I'm usually, like, very skeptical, shall I say, about any phone calls, any emails. I mean, you know... I, I don't like to be um, taken advantage of. Anyway, I got this phone call saying uh, there was some problems with your past taxes and you know we, we need you to call us back. So I called the guy back. He said, uh, yeah, there's been some problems with your taxes. You owe these taxes. You failed to do it. We're sending a police officer to your house. They'll be there in 30 minutes to pick you up. And he hangs up on me. Now, now normally... I would probably have been a little skeptical. However, I will say, as a pastor, our taxes are a little bit different than a normal individual's. And so I was like, maybe I've made a mistake. I don't know. I hope I didn't make a mistake, but perhaps I did. And, and this guy's saying, the cops are coming. I'm calling, I'm calling back. I call back, and now I'm starting to get, I'm like trying to find out what's going on, what's going on. And then the guy started like, not making sense. He's like, well, you got to go to the bank and you got to keep me on the phone and get the money out and wire. And I'm like, okay. I'm like, okay, this is not a legitimate thing. And eventually I just said, no, take a hike. And I hung up on. But for about 30 minutes there, I was anxious for nothing. I was anxious for this guy trying to scam me. Fortunately, God gave me the wisdom to, I googled the phone number that was on the caller ID and I started seeing all this stuff and I was like, okay, this guy's, you know, he's just trying to, to rip me off. But man, it was even a couple of days later that I'm, I still felt this like anxiety. I'm like, am I going to jail? You know, I see a cop and I'm like ducking behind the steering wheel and I'm like, honestly, officer, I didn't do it. <laughs> Joyce Meyer said this. Joyce Meyer says, worry is down payment on a problem you may never even have. Thank you, Joyce. <laughs> worry is a down payment 
on a problem you may never even have. You ever panic for nothing? Worry for nothing? Man, I do that sometimes. You know, it's like, like you go out somewhere and, and then, and then you, you hear a siren or something and then you start saying, hmm, I wonder if that's going to my house. You know, I wonder, did I leave the stove on? I, I don't, oh, I bet I did. I bet the house is on fire now. I bet it's going, man, Fido is going to die in the fire. And, and, and man, we're just getting so worked up. And I'm like, what am I going to do? I, should I call the fire department now? Or, or, or what should I do? And, and so we race home and, and there's our house just sitting there like it always was. Man, we're worried about nothing. We, we worry about something and we find out it was all for nothing. So in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 4, verse 35, it says, As evening came, Jesus said to his disciples, Let's cross to the other side of the lake. I want you to remember that. Cross to the where? Other side of the lake. Now, Jesus spent his day teaching. Teaching can be very draining at times, and he's teaching, and he's feeling drained, and he's like, let's, let's get out of here. So him and his disciples get in the boat. He's like, we're going to go. Verse 36. So they took Jesus in the boat and started out, leaving the crowds behind him. Although other boats still followed him. So Jesus and his disciples are going. Other boats, they start following. Verse 37. But as soon a fierce storm came up. The Sea of Galilee uh, is actually a sea, and it's, it's, it's in this, uh, like a basin with surrounding mountains, so winds can come through. And even to this very day, it can whip up these very, very, very big storms. And so here they are, they're in this boat, this small wooden boat. They're going across, and this storm, a fierce storm came up. High waves were breaking into the boat. I don't know if you've ever been in a boat with high waves breaking into it, but it can be a little nerve-wracking. You might feel a little bit of anxiety in this situation. High waves were breaking into the boat, and it began to fill with water. How, how would you like that? You're going out. And, and as you're crossing the lake, I mean, the storm starts hitting you, and water is filling up the boat. You know, there ain't no Coast Guard to call. I mean, if, if you sink, that's it. You can't swim to shore from here. Have you ever felt nearly swamped in your life? Have you ever felt like you're in the middle of the storm, and, and your life is starting to, to fill up, and you're starting to, to, to feel swamped? Man, you're showing up, but just barely... Like, man, I barely made it here to church this morning. I'm smiling on the outside, but you don't want to see what's behind that smile. Anybody, or is it just me? Maybe it's just me, I don't know. And, and, and we're going through these things, feeling swamped, facing these storms. And, and here, I love it, it it's, it's like this, the Bible has a sense of humor. Verse 38, it says, Jesus was sleeping at the back of the boat. With his head on a cushion. Here they are. They're crossing the lake. And Jesus is sleeping in the back of the boat. And the disciples woke him up doing what? Shouting, teacher, don't you care? We're going to drown. We're going to drown. And you're sleeping. At least wake up so you can drown while you're awake. No one wants to drown while they're sleeping. Now wake up. If you remember the story of Jonah, he was in a boat and he faced a storm too. Sometimes though, God sends the storms in our life to get us back on track. Jonah was going the wrong way. He was sleeping in the boat too. But why was he sleeping? He was sleeping because he was being complacent. He didn't care. He was running. Jesus was sleeping because he was confident. And here's Jonah going and a storm hit. And it was to reroute him, to redirect him back to where he should be going. God used the storm to turn his life around. Sometimes we face storms in our life. We face winds in our life. We feel like the waves are crashing up against us. And we feel like Jesus is sleeping in the back of the boat. Jesus, don't you know what I'm going through? Don't you know the sickness that I'm facing? Don't you know this trauma in my family? Why are you sleeping? I'm going to drown. Don't you even care? 
What did I tell you to remember? He said, we're going to the other side. He told them to get into the boat. Here's Jesus, the creator of the universe, says, get into the boat. Guess what? He probably knew the weather patterns. He probably knew there was going to be a storm. He sent them into that storm. And then he went to sleep. But sometimes, have you ever noticed this? Sometimes we create our own storms, don't we? We create our own storms. It's like there was a sea captain, and, and, and he was interviewing a, a new crew member for the, for the ship, and he says, okay, if we're at sea and a storm comes against the port side, what are you going to do? And the crew member says, I'm going to throw out an anchor. He says, okay, now another storm comes from the starboard side. Now what are you going to do? He says, I'm going to throw out another anchor. He says, now a storm comes from the forward side. Now what are you going to do? He says, I'm going to throw out another anchor. And the sea captain says, where in the world are you getting all these anchors? He said, I'm getting them the same place you're getting all the storms. <laughs> Sometimes we make up our own storms. Here's a couple of things, five things, five ways that we make up storms. The first one is our words. Our words. How are we talking? How are we speaking to people? Man, we get up in the morning and we're like, man, this is going to just be a miserable day. How do you, I feel horrible. You know, people say, how are you doing? I'm not so good. I just don't feel good. And we talk to ourselves. We make a mistake. Man, you're just a loser. We're talking to ourselves. We're, we're, we're building up all these words in our life. We're creating our own storm by the words that we say. Here's a challenge for you. This week, whatever you say, add on to the end of it. And that's just the way I want it. Man, I just can't stand my boss. He just treats me like garbage. And that's the, just the way I want it. <laughs> or man, I don't know how I'm going to ever pay these bills. I just don't make enough money. I just can't ever get out of this debt. And that's just the way I want it. Man, it, it'll, it'll cause us to evaluate what we're saying. The Bible says sometimes we're snared, we're trapped by the words of our mouth. And we're saying things, and when we say things, we start to believe them. And that doesn't do anybody any good. So the words are one thing that we, we build up these storms. The next thing is an approach. How do we approach things in our life? You wake up in the morning, and you go to work. Man, you guys driven on 84 lately? They said, next five years, we're going to have traffic. So you get up in the morning, and you hate traffic, and you get on the interstate, and you're sitting there in traffic for 30 minutes, and you're like, man, I just hate it. Man, why did governor, you know, approve this thing? And now, now i got to sit here in traffic. And, and you get to work, and then you're, I hate my job. And you get home, and how was your, it was a horrible day. Maybe your approach was wrong. Maybe you should have taken a back road to get to work. Sometimes our approach is wrong. You know, we're making our own waves with how we approach things. You know, you, we want something in life, so we approach it by, by going into more debt. We, our approach is wrong. Next thing is, is the voices that we listen to. What kind of voices are we listening to? Man, with, with cell phones now, we, we're able to get up, and before we even get out of the bed and go to the bath, and we've already seen all the headline news, and, and, and we have 24-7 access to the news on TV, and we're listening to these voices, and then our friends and our coworkers and our family members, and they're saying all this stuff, and we're believing it, and we listen to depressing things, and we watch depressing things, and then we wonder why in the world world we feel depressed. Come on. It's no wonder you're going to feel depressed when you eat depressing things. The next thing is expectations. Sometimes we're just not expecting a storm. And man, if you're not expecting a storm and you get a storm, then you're depressed. You're angry. You feel anxious. How could this storm ever happen? Man, you didn't watch the Weather Channel. You didn't know there's a storm coming. When you know there's a storm coming, man, we can face it with boldness. It's not a surprise. That's why in the Bible, God teaches us to put on the whole armor of God so that we can withstand any of these storms that come our way. The next thing is shame. Man, this one's big. 
if you're hiding things, if there's shame in your life. Man, we're feeling tormented. We're feeling guilty about something that God's already forgiven us about. There is a difference between conviction and shame or conviction and guilt. See, conviction is a tool that God uses in our life to say, hey, this is a direction you shouldn't go to. You shouldn't be doing this. There's no condemnation with conviction. God's conviction is inspiring us to turn around and go the other way, to stop doing whatever it is that we're feeling convicted of. Shame is saying, you're just a low-down, no-good, rotten sinner, and you're never going to be free of your past. Man, God's already forgiven you. It's time for us to move on because God certainly has already moved on. Mark chapter 4, verse 35, moving on here. It says, As evening came, Jesus said to his disciples, Oh, we already read that. Go to the other side. Um, now, Jesus, uh, where was it? He's sleeping. Okay, Jesus is sleeping in the back of the boat with his head on the cushions. They yell, Teacher, why don't you wake us up? They're, they're yelling, wake us up. Do you want us to drown? But verse 39 says, when Jesus woke up, he rebuked the wind and he said to the waves, silence, be still. Three words. Three words. Silence, be still. And suddenly the wind stopped and there was a great calm. Then he asked them, why are you afraid? Do you still have no faith? Just three words. I said, we're going to the other side. I said, get in. We're going to the other side. He's not going to lead you and halfway let you drown. He's saying, we're going to the other side. But sometimes we got to go through a few storms in order to see that what he's saying is true. This, is, this next verse is funny. Verse 41. The disciples were absolutely terrified, okay? If they, they were anxious before, and now they're terrified. They're like, Jesus, we're going to die. He gets up, silence, be still. Oh, my goodness. Now they're terrified. They're, they're afraid. Says, Who is this man? They said, even the wind and waves obey him. It was like he just shut off the shower head, and boom, the rain stopped, the storm stopped. And they're like, Wow. The winds blew, and sometimes they blow at us. We feel the winds blowing in our lives. We feel the storms coming. We feel the waves crashing against us, and we think that we're going to capsize. And we say, God doesn't care. How could he care? If he cared, he would wake up. He's going to let me drown. I'm going to die. And we're anxious for nothing. The disciples were anxious for nothing, and they got to the other side. But my question is this, is why did Jesus send them into the storm? Somebody has, you know, gets healed maybe of cancer or something, and we rejoice and we're all excited. But the question becomes, why did they go through the storm in the first place. And some people go through the storm and they don't get healed. Why do we go into the storm? Doesn't God care? Doesn't Jesus care? You know the thing that I believe is I believe Jesus fell asleep because he wanted to be wake, woken up. Right? He wanted to be, he says, let your request be made known to God. He wants us to come to him. He wants us to ask him. He wants us to make requests of him. He wants us to go to him, but don't assume that he doesn't care. See, I believe that Jesus brought the disciples through the storm, not to test them, but to teach them something. The waves and the wind was an illustration. Here is this big storm that's going on, but the real storm, listen, the real storm is not outside. The real storm is going on inside. That's where the real storm is. In James 1, 6, he says, But when you ask, you must believe and not doubt, because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea blown and tossed by the wind. Do you doubt? Do you doubt? Do you, do you trust Jesus and what he says is true? Or are we doubting? Because if we're doubting, we're being tossed by the waves of the sea. See, God allows us to experience these storms 
so that we can learn to calm the storms that are within us. That's where the real waves are, is within us. Jesus stood up and says, quiet, be still. And now it's your turn to turn to the wind and the waves and the storms inside and say, quiet, be still. Speak to these winds and the waves. Learn how to ride these waves that are inside of us so that we can face the waves and storms that are outside. We think the problem is that God won't call, calm the waves, but really he's waiting for us to learn to calm the ones inside. You know, it's the atmosphere of our heart. What is the atmosphere of our heart like? Man, are, are you continually anxious? Are you, are you short with people? You play the blame game all the time. It's time to get up. It's time to, to wake up our faith. Awaken the brave inside of us. We're going to watch a, a quick little clip here. And this is a section of the Sermon on the Mount when Jesus is talking about how beneficial worry really is. Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life. What you will eat and what you will drink, nor about your body or what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? I mean, look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin, yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O oh, you of little faith? Therefore, do not be anxious, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. us to awaken the brave within. It's time for us to turn our doubt into faith. And it's time for us to turn it into trust. How do we do that? The first thing is believing. Believing. You know, what, what he said is true. I'm going to put my faith and my trust in him. George Mueller said, the beginning of anxiety is the end of faith. And the beginning of true faith is the end of anxiety. Man, we need to believe. Believe that He is who He says He is. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And if we believe that, man, that's the first step into getting rid of the anxiety in our life. The next thing, though, is remembering. Remembering what? He told us we're going to the other side of the lake. He told us we're going. He says in his word, he says, he is the author and finisher of our faith. He who began the good work in you is faithful to complete it. You might say, but he's sleeping in the boat. Maybe he is, but he's not unaware of what's going on. He has you there for a reason. And then we ask, says, make your request made known to God. Not come to him like saying, Jesus, are you going to let me die? But ask, come boldly before his throne. And then we elevate, elevate to praise, praise God. We, we move higher and closer to God because you know what? The atmospheric pressure gets less as elevation increases. Let me say that again. The atmospheric pressure, the pressures of life, they get less as our elevation increases the closer we get to God when we praise him when we worship him in our lives man that pressure begins to subside 
Yeah, there's some heavy things that we might be facing in our lives. We might be facing pain and disappointment and discouragement and depression and all of these things, he says, all of these what? Things we are more than conquerors through Christ Jesus. But we need to praise him in the storm. This is everything with thanksgiving, with praise. We bring these things to him. And our anxiety begins to fall away. And we discover that all along he put that bravery inside of us. Father, we come to you. And we thank you for your word. We thank you for the bravery that you've put in each of us. But Lord, sometimes we get so caught up by the cares of this world that we begin to be anxious. We begin to be scared. We begin to be fearful. And we trade in our courage and our bravery for anxiety and fear and depression. Father, set us free from these things. Let us give you thanks. Let us give you praise. We believe in you and we believe that what you said is true, that you are the author and finisher. You're going to finish the work that you started. You're going to get us to the other side of the sea, whatever storms we may face. Some of you here maybe have not made the decision to actually believe in Christ. And it is a decision that we make. And Father, for those that are here, just reveal yourself to them. Help them to realize that you are the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to God except through Jesus Christ. And if we believe it, and if we say that with our mouth, that we can be saved. Bless them, Lord. Let's stand together. And one thing that I've talked about numerous times, and it's something that I, I feel is, is important to us, is that in the Old Testament, oftentimes when there was, there was battles to be fought, the praisers would go out first, the singers would go out first, the people giving thanks and thanksgiving would be the ones that were first into the battle because when we give God praise, then He will fight the battles for us. Let's sing together.